John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Good morning, Todd. How are you today? Oh, good morning. Doing just dandy. Yes. Well, I've done another interesting accident that uh, in, involves some pilots. Not that we're picking on pilots, but I try to use our expertise sometimes when uh, Greg's not here. And uh, so we have an interesting part, 91 accident that occurred in North Carolina involving skydivers. And then this particular airplane was off getting uh, dumping skydivers at altitude and coming back down and probably reloading and do it again. And we had a, an interesting event at altitude. The first officer apparently was uh, not feeling well uh, and it appears to be anxiety related. He thought he was getting a check ride, which proved it wasn't true, but that's what he thought. And he was getting all hot and upset. It felt like uh, he was going to have trouble containing his lunch. And he left the, the, the uh, first officer's seat and went back to get some fresh air where the, this particular airplane, the door opens in the back for the skydivers to exit and he was gonna go back and get some air and something happened and he actually went out the airplane and perished. And in bringing the airplane back in, the pilot then had other problems and uh, missed the, the runway and tore the landing gear off and a whole bunch of other problems. But the interesting part of this event, the most interesting part, is the fact that the first officer was self-medicating for anxiety and was having uh, emotional problems on board the flight. So, and I know you just finished an analysis of this thought, so why don't you take it from there and let's talk about it. Well, this is a uh, July 29, 2022 event that happened um, in uh, North Carolina. This is a CASA 212 aircraft, like uh, John said, what was involved in skydiving activity. And although it was a part 91 flight, um, the two pilots were rather uh, experienced. The pilot in command was a 51 year old ATP and flight instructor pilot with uh, over 2000 hours total. The second in command, the person who either jumped or fell out of the aircraft later on in the flight was only 23, but he had about a thousand hours and he was also a commercial flight instructor. So these are two people who have some experience. And one of the things that stands out about this after the fact is they were talking with witnesses, family members about the second in command's behavior and attitude. Uh, he was a perfectionist, very hard on himself when he made mistakes, and wanted to really impress upon the pilot in command, who was the chief pilot, about his ability to do the job. And apparently he had, in a previous position, landed gear up. So things dealing with landing gear might have been a triggering event, but I'm just speculating here. On the actual accident flight, they had already had the skydivers leave the aircraft. They're coming in for landing. They encounter wind shear, have a hard landing, and they take off again. There's damaged landing gear. 
And during this flight, as they were flying away from the airport, the second in command got very agitated, felt that he had to you know, get some air, felt like he was about to throw up. And he uh, let me get the wording right, because this is the thing that uh, stood out to me. About 20 minutes into the diversion, after they conducted the approach and emergency briefing, the second in command became visibly upset. He opened the side cockpit window, lowered the ramp in the back of the airplane, indicating he felt like he was going to be sick and needed air. Now, reading this, I said to myself, this person is flying the airplane. If you're going to be sick and you have the side window open and presumably you have you know, a bag somewhere nearby, why would you need to go to the back of the airplane to use the ramp? But I digress. The person gets out of his seat, goes to the back of the airplane and either fly, uh, falls out or jumps out. Uh, afterwards, the, uh, first, the pilot in command, in my opinion, was uh, also stressed out by not only the previous hard landing, but by the, by the fact his second in command is no longer there. And as uh, John said, uh, they landed, uh, he landed again and caused more damage to the airplane. And looking into the rest of the report, which you will have available on the page that hosts this uh, episode, they interviewed the pilot's uh, co-workers, family, and this is a picture of someone who was very much a perfectionist, very much someone who wanted to, you know, hit all the marks when it comes to flying. And there was even a story they tell about uh, he left his fuel card back at a fuel farm. He got very upset, face turned red. Person was with, with said, hey, walk back to the fuel farm, get the card and come back. He takes off running toward the fuel farm to get the card and come back. Now, after the fact of all this, you might say to yourself, well, these were warning signs. But if you were that person who was with this person when his face turns red and gets upset with the card, and you know this person's a perfectionist, uh, that's within normal behavior of uh, coworkers. And again, not just pilot coworkers, but any coworker. You work long enough with enough people, you'll run across people who have many of these same characteristics. Now, I by myself would not think these are characteristics that are conducive to suicidal behavior on the job. And another thing that um, intrigued me about this, and John, you mentioned my expertise, I'm not an expert pilot, but I am an expert at reading between the lines and figuring out that, hey, there's something missing here. And the part that's missing here is what they went into detail about this pilot was doing in his um, free time. Apparently, he was using an over-the-counter, or at least available over-the-counter, uh, substance to deal with anxiety. Medical report mentioned that there was ethanol in the system, which was consistent with what happens to the body after someone's deceased. So there's no indication that he was actually drinking. But there was one drug that jumped out at me. Gynine, or mitragynine. I'm mispronouncing this probably. My, my apologies. Predominant active substance in the drug Kratom comes from the leaf of a, leaves of a tropical tree. It's often used over the counter in like a tea to deal with anxiety. And here's where it gets kind of weird. Um, first, the Food and Drug Administration, they mention this, has not approved this for any use and warns consumers not to use the drug, citing safety concerns that need further research, including risk of abuse and addiction. Okay. The US DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, has identified Kratom as a drug of concern, quote unquote, but has not listed it as a federally controlled substance, which means, and I'm speculating here, if someone's selling this over the counter, there might not be any rules against selling it, and they can make all sorts of uh, promises of what this stuff will do for you. Doesn't mean it will do anything, So because there hasn't been enough research on it. It may or may not be abusive or, or subject to uh, abuse, and it falls between the cracks. And here's the line that got both John and I. Kratom use is considered disqualifying for pilots under internal FAA policy. Now, I'd have to read the regulations to see if there's any regulation out there in public that says this. But the implication is it's under internal FAA policy, but they haven't gotten to the point of telling everybody else about it. So my question is, if this is so darn dangerous and you don't want pilots to use it, what's keeping you from coming right out and saying, don't use this stuff? Now, that said, the probable cause made no mention of this as a part of the, what happened. And here's the probable cause. 
The airplanes encountered with wind shear during landing, which resulted in a hard landing and separation of the right main landing gear, and the pilot's subsequent decision to leave his seat in flight, which resulted in his fall from the airplane. Now, that's leaving out part of the story in the earlier part of the, uh, of the report because they said he opened up his side window and lowered the ramp. He did more than just leave his seat. So it wasn't like there was a big gap in the airplane. There was a lamp, a ramp lowered, and the person, in my opinion, deliberately did this in order to perhaps just throw up out the back of the airplane, maybe accidentally fell out. Who knows? Because there's no mention of any suicide note or anything like this. So, John, this brings up the whole issue, which has come up again and again in aviation, about the mental health of crew members, flight crew, cabin crew, even mechanics for that matter. In the U.S. and in most of the world, there are strict limits as to what kind of information the government or your employer can find out about your current medical condition. And also, if you are a pilot and you admit that you have certain psychological or psychiatric things going on or taking medicine for said same, this could disqualify you from, from flying. So on the one hand, they can't ask you and they can't force you to give the information. But if you voluntarily give the information, it could end your career. So I don't know if this is one of those cases, but there's a lot of pieces here that uh, could use some explanation and, and some thought. Yes, without a doubt. The whole issue of mental health across the board in this, in this country and the world needs to be addressed. You know, we still, you know, I travel all over, the, all over the world, actually, but a lot all over the U.S., and virtually every city I go to, there's people on the street, right? And they're not just poor people on the street. They're people that have mental illness, untreated mental illness, because we're not dealing with it. Our, our commercial insurance limits how much, how much uh, money that they will spend treating any kind of mental illness you may have. If you don't have it, the public health people are in the same problem, not enough resources to treat mental health. Uh, even, even our efforts to uh, go to a, a Medicaid or medical care for all has excluded mental illness. I mean, somewhere along the line, we need to face the, the burden of addressing these issues with people. And by addressing the issues, I don't only mean you know, putting these people in institutions. I mean, treating them and getting them healthy, getting the right meds to them. And we probably need to do a lot more work on what the right meds are, because I think there may be better, you know, better formulas, if you will, for, for meds that can be developed. I mean, it's time we do it. We've had people, I mean, we've had uh, people who are in postal in the post office for mental health illness. And that came, most likely came out of Vietnam, but I'm, I'm speculating there myself. But there's a lot of problems in society with people that are having lapses, mental lapses of some kind. And as a society, we need to start facing up to that and including our pilot community. You know, we have that, that German wings one that killed everybody on board. Uh, we had Egypt here that had a pilot with uh, some sort of a mental problem. I mean, there's there's a lot of examples that are out there, and they they they're really pretty sneaky. You know, people can have it, self-medicate, and it just sits there at a low level, and then one day uh, something comes together and it turns into a disaster. So, as a society, we really need to start looking at what we what we can do to address this problem. And uh, my second to last word along those lines is, what can the aviation world do to deal with this? And I can't help but think of the classic James Reason Swiss cheese model of aviation safety, where every layer of safety has a few holes in it. But if you have enough layers strung together, you know, it's very difficult for something to go all the way through those layers. Well, here is a layer that has big holes in it, or maybe be non-existent altogether. And the mental health layer has several pieces of it. One piece of which is, can you change the rules? Can you change the process so that someone who comes forward with mental health 
gets treated for mental health and is able under almost every circumstance to keep their career. And right now, the huge incentive is to not do what's right for you by your mental health, not do what's right for you by your coworkers, not do what's right by the passengers, by continuing to self-medicate or continuing to keep hidden that which you might know and the people around you might know might cause you problems. But it's almost like society, societally speaking, our hands are tied with taking positive action. Very good advice. I mean, I, there's no, no easy answer, no easy answer. Right, but there is an easier answer for a lot of our problems, our, our crashes and incidents, and that is pre-planning for your flight, good pre-flight. When you take off, put that head on a swivel because there's so much going on out there today in and around our airports. And after you get in the air, please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.